Hey, this one's about the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. It's a well-known trick among salesmen that if you nod while you deliver your pitch, your prospective clients will often start nodding along as well, putting them in a more agreeable state subconsciously. When we walk into a room full of laughing people, we'll often start smiling before we even know what's going on. And when we hear this, we're alert and ready for danger. Hearing other people's fear makes us afraid as well. Horror movies exploit this natural empathy. Anytime a hidden monster pops out of the darkness, a scream is sure to follow. It's the ultimate exclamation mark, something we let loose when language leaves us to signal that we're reverting to some primal state because our ordered world has been shattered. I'm one of the many people who think that the Texas Chainsaw Massacre is the scariest movie of all time. And you know, there's very little in the way of on-screen violence in it. Not to take anything away from the brilliant cinematography or the disgustingly dirty aesthetics of the visuals, but I think the sound design is really what elevates it to a whole other level. I could go on and on about the ambient industrial nightmare that is this movie's soundtrack. How it's animal noises and metallic thrums make me feel like I'm in a slaughterhouse waiting to be killed. But there's something uniquely masterful in the way this movie uses the human voice. The movie's really interested in the animalistic natures that are revealed when language is rendered pointless. The hitchhiker babbles incoherently throughout the whole movie. Leatherface can't speak at all. Sally is thrust into a situation where words can't help her. Any attempt at communication is completely ignored. This chase scene, it's very simple. There are no words except for help and please, which, like all of Sally's lines after this point, are ignored. There are plenty of horror movies that have a scenario where the victims can't communicate with their attackers, but the Texas Chainsaw Massacre really draws these moments out without giving us a moment to catch our breath. Sally never hides or takes a moment to come up with a plan. The movie just drowns us in this chase which lasts for nearly six whole minutes and feels like 20. She runs and she screams and she runs and she screams. Instead of these screams giving us hope that she might escape or get help or even giving us some kind of catharsis because something loud is being released. The longer she screams, the more hopeless things start to feel. She's just being drowned out by a much mightier, deadlier scream. The scream of a weapon who's channeling the rage and fear of a man whose entire world is nothing but pain and death. That's why it's such a relief when she finally finds the old man. Not just because you think he might help her, but also because he's somebody that she can actually talk to and communicate with. Which is why it's so upsetting when he betrays her. Ah, that scene in the truck where his soothing words are undercut by his true nature. While Sally is just still screaming into her gag, muffled but still never ending. You got nothing to worry about, you. You just take it easy, yeah? <laughs> we will be there soon. <laughs> this wild, mad dash for freedom is followed by the dinner scene, where the screaming goes from a gazelle running from a lion to the moo of a cow at a slaughterhouse. Not only are her pleas for help completely ignored, but one gets the feeling that they're not even really understood. I've never seen a movie use screaming as character development the way this movie does, especially this scene. There's a point where Sally isn't even really screaming for help anymore. She's just screaming because that's all she has left of herself. This is the moment where language completely breaks down. The whole long scene is mostly Sally screaming, the hitchhiker giggling, Leatherface grunting, and the grandfather sitting silently. The old man is the only one who regularly speaks without raising his voice, and his comfortable command of language amid all this screaming and cackling is somehow even worse than the noise. 
This is the scene where the monsters go from being random murderers to a family with a really specific world view. Everyone's an animal, and the world is a slaughterhouse. People aren't people to them. They're just meat to fill their bellies or bones and skin to decorate their house with. No more worthy of concern than the dead armadillo on the side of the road that opens the movie. They just want to eat and lurk in their hellish little habitat of skin, bone, and feathers as far removed from the civilized world as possible. Their garbled jabbering and snapping at each other is their savage approximation of domestic tranquility. It's a sort of insane symphony and Sally's screaming harmonizes with it perfectly. She fits right in. In this scene, we watch her mind snap. This is the point where we know that even if she escapes, Sally will never be okay again. And just like the nodding salesman, Sally's screams force us to take that ride with her. When she finally escapes and wordlessly shrieks for the help of that truck driver, it's all we can do to keep from screeching too. I know I did. And even though she survives, there's no sigh of relief. In a really perverse way, the ending validates the family's belief that underneath our armor of security and civilization, we're all just terrified beasts. Far from being a triumphant moment, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre ends with two utterly wild animals howling at the sky. The end. See you next time.